Exodus 34, starting in verse 4, says, So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones. And he went up Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him, and he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. He passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished and punishes the children and their children's children for the sins of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. And so Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshiped. During this series, we're taking a look at some good questions about the character of God. In fact, these questions came to us from one of our friends who recently started pursuing a relationship with God. And as they did, they had all kinds of questions. What is God like? How does any of this work? And so we thought, let's take the first part of our year and answer these questions. And if you missed any of the past weeks, you can go back and listen to those. We're taking the first five weeks and we're answering some of their questions. And then the next five weeks, we're answering questions that you're sending in. So anytime during these weeks you have questions that you'd like us to answer, you can just uh, send those totally anonymously to cotm.info. And uh, really cool, by the way, uh, to do this, I want to do this in a way that honors them and doesn't call them out. But the person that sent these questions to us in the first place and has been exploring faith in Christ, uh, last year, right here, sitting in these seats, gave their heart to Christ and crossed the line of faith. I think that's worth celebrating. So if these questions didn't help anybody else, they brought, that, they brought our, our friend to a place of faith and commitment to Christ, and we love that. And so here's the question that we're looking at today. And, the, and again, the, the idea behind all of these questions is just this. The more clearly we see God, the more boldly we can follow him and the more of his life we experience. And so here's our question today. It's this, is God loving or angry? What, and the question underneath this, I, I love the, the, the sub-question. It may be in your notes, maybe it's not, but it says, uh, it says, why does it feel like when I read through the Bible, why does it feel like God is mad and Jesus is nice? Have you ever noticed that? It feels like if you read through the stories of the Old Testament, there's these stories of vengeance and fire and often entire people groups getting wiped out, a flood that eradicated all human life on the earth except for the people that were in the ark. And it feels like God is wrathful and angry. And then we get to Jesus, and it's like, man, he is so cool. Like, this guy just, got, everybody's healed, everybody's better. What gives, what, is, and the question under this question, is God loving or angry, is really this question. What is God like, and can I trust him? And the reason that this matters, whether you've been following God for a long time or you're just starting, is because every single person that's ever lived has a desire in their heart to know and understand God. In fact, the book of Ecclesiastes says that God has set eternity in the human heart. This is one of the things that's totally unique about humans. You've never, uh, we've never once encountered an, a group of animals, whether it's you know, earthworms, sharks, or tigers that have any concern about deity, God, or the supernatural at all. They're not worried about it. They're not thinking about it. But yet, the opposite is true, that every single hum people group, every single group of human beings that, are, that uh, sociologists, anthropologists, archaeologists have discovered anywhere in the world, including the most recent undiscovered uh, people groups that we have found, Every single group, whether they live in the jungle or a metropolitan city, has had some expression of God worship, some way that they organized their life, their tribe, their city around trying to make sense of God, to worship him, to make him happy. All different kinds of expressions, all different understandings, but every human heart is turned with a desire to understand who God is. So all of the debates, whether it's uh, atheists, agnostics, deists, uh, theists, every single group of people that approach God approach it from this place. I want to know what's out there and beyond. There is something more and I want to understand it. But the danger is this. All we have to understand the supernatural, infinite, beyond, greater than, bigger than God is our experience. We have to try to understand this God just through the little snippets of life we experience and the stories we read in the Bible, and we're trying to understand who God is. And the problem is, 
that very often we'll take just one snippet of information and try to build a theology around who God is based on that one thing. Do you remember the old movie? I have four sisters, and my two older sisters watched this movie over and over again until they wore the VHS out. If you don't know what a VHS is, you are young, and you got a great life ahead of you. Praise God. But the, they, they wore out the VHS of this old movie, The Gods Must Be Crazy. Anybody watch this movie? Anybody remember this movie? The basic premise of this movie is this, is that in this movie, uh, The Gods Must Be Crazy, there's a an airplane that's flying over. In fact, uh, this is the, uh, this is the um, tribesman in Africa that is on the ground living in this rural tribe, and this airplane pilot is flying over. He drinks a Coke, and he drops the Coke bottle out of his airplane. It falls, and it hits this tribesman. And when this Coke bottle falls, all of a sudden, this thing that they had never seen or experienced before drops out of the sky. And can you imagine if that was you? You don't know what an airplane is. You don't know what Coke is. You don't know what a glass bottle is. And this falls out of the sky and it drops. And now all of a sudden this tribe is forced to, to make a theological interpretation of this event that happened in their life. And here's what, they, here's what they decide. The gods are angry. They've given us this. And now I have to try to take this back to the gods in order to make them happy. Now, on the outside, it makes for a, a very comical, hilarious movie, but it's also incredibly silly, but here's the challenge. Most people do exactly the same thing when it comes to God, is they form a theology based on a snapshot, an event, something that happened in their lives, and they try to interpret what God is like and what it means for them and how we should orient our life around this. Do you remember the movie Bruce Almighty? Guys, the theology is getting deep in here today. In Bruce Almighty, Jim Carrey gets bestowed by Morgan Freeman, who is God, which just is perfect. And Morgan Freeman bestows the powers of God on, on Jim Carrey. And in, in, as he sort of begins to discover that he has this, this gift of now being God, what does he do? He starts to express it as power. And there's a, there's a scene in the movie where he's, uh, he's, he's making the tomato soup in his bowl part like the Red Sea, which is just awesome. And then there's another scene where he's walking down the street and he's starting to realize that he can make things happen. And as he's walking down the street, there's this moment of realization where he's sort of looking at his hands like, I did that. And then he just kind of goes crazy. Everything that he imagined that he wanted to do, he did. And he's making all of his dreams come true. And, and he's expressing what I think is hidden in a lot of our hearts is that the default, and it's, it's shown in many of our movies and in much of our art and in our music, is that God is primarily power. God is primarily the power to do what he wants with the universe, and so therefore our main approach to God is to understand him as a power that must be appeased or as a, as a theology or a religion, a group of behaviors and facts that must be learned in order to make that God happy. But the truth is, the reason that many people walk away from God is because that is a fundamental misunderstanding of who God is and what God is about. God is not a religion to learn. God is not a power to appease. God shows us through the story of Scripture that he is primarily, although God is powerful, although there is a, there is a, a great theology to learn about God, God is primarily, first and foremost, a personality to know and to build a relationship with. Therefore, if God is a personality to know and a relationship to build, then God is not to be understood through any one single snippet of experience in your life or one story out of the Bible. The knowledge of God, and you can write this down, is progressive. Meaning that, the, that, in, that in a relationship with God, our knowledge of who he is and how he thinks and how he acts is going to be something that progresses not just today, but for all time. And there's two important encounters in the Bible with a character named Moses. And Moses is a pivotal turning point in the story of God's people. Because before Moses, there were individuals that followed God. Far back as the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve followed God as individuals. A guy named Enoch followed God as an individual. Abraham and his family followed God as individuals. But that family goes into captivity in Egypt, and they now grow into a nation. And Moses is called to bring that group of people out of captivity through the wilderness and eventually into the promise that God has for them. But before 
they embark on this incredibly important journey from turning from just being a couple people to being a group of people that God always envisioned, a big group of people following him, a large family of sons and daughters. This is what God wanted. God knows that he has to show Moses more of who he is in order for Moses and the children of Israel to have a better understanding of how to follow him more boldly and more closely. And so the first encounter we get with Moses is that the famous encounter at the burning bush, and it's found in Exodus. And I want to just read a, a snippet of this, these verses to you to show uh, what this is like. So if you think about the story of God and the progression of the story of God, Adam and Eve know God fully. They walk with God daily, Genesis says, in the garden in the cool of the day, which I think is just an awesome fact that the Bible points out, like walking with God should feel like that, it should feel refreshing, and then sin enters the equation, and what happens, they lose that closeness, that relationship, so God has to reset the, the timer, so to speak, on his relationship with us, and slowly, starting after Adam and Eve, he starts to reveal a little bit more and a little bit more of who he is to people, building this relationship over time, and when God shows up with Moses, about to embark on this incredible journey, this, this is what he says in Exodus chapter 6, God said to Moses, I am the Lord, and this is where he first says his name, which will become important in a few minutes as we talk through this. I am the Lord Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but my name, Yahweh, I, I did not make myself known to them by that, but I'm going to tell you my name. Now, what is God doing? God's saying that even Abraham, who's called a friend of God, and it's not like Abraham had some kind of JV relationship with God. It wasn't that Abraham had a lesser relationship with God than Moses. However, God's saying, I'm going to build on that, and I'm going to show you even more because this next part of the journey is going to require more faith from you, so I'm going to show you more of who I am. I'm going to get to know you even deeper. And this is the challenge for us, is to understand that all of us, no matter how confident we feel, no matter how much we feel like we can grab our phone and look up on Wikipedia all the facts and the knowledge and the information about God, you and I still are in the process of this long story of God where we're getting to know Him. And it's important because if we don't understand God and approach God that way, we will make wrong judgments based on isolated incidents. And we'll think that we know everything instead of framing our relationship with God at the, at the fundamental core of being dropped into a long story that didn't start when you were born and it won't end when you die. There's a long story of the people of God and our job as we parachute into that story is to look back and look forward and go, okay, God, who are you and what are you doing and how do I get to know you in a way that helps me to live out that relationship in the right way in my life. If you remember the very first scene of Star Wars A New Hope, uh, we're just going full on movie theology today, gang, come on. So anybody, by the way, anybody, was anybody in the movie theater to see Star Wars A New Hope when it first came out? Any, any OGs? Oh, you guys are old school, come on, that's it. Oh, I'm so jealous, I wish I could have been there to feel that moment, but the very first experience we have with Star Wars, before Jar Jar Binks and some things got jacked up, the first experience we have with Star Wars are these little yellow words scrolling up the screen. And this moment where the music kind of starts and it's ominous, and this is what it says, is this scroll starts up the screens. It says, a new hope. It is a period of civil war. Rebel spaceships striking from a hidden base have won their first victory against the evil empire. And you're just parachuted into a story. Why is the empire evil? Who are the rebels? Where was their base? What victory did they win? Do I like them? Do I not like them? What side are we on? You don't know any of it. You're just parachuted into the story. And if you just stopped, walked out, and said, I don't, I, I don't understand any of this, you'd miss out on this incredible adventure. But over the course of the movies, what happens is you start to understand, oh, that's the empire. Oh, that's who the rebels are. Oh, that's what they're up to. That was the battle. Okay, I, I, I can start to understand more of this, and I start to get context about this. But you don't make a judgment of Star Wars based on the scroll. And very often what happens with God is we see the scroll and we go, Whoa, 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 what's going on with the genocide? Wiping out people groups? Hold on, what's the flood? What is, what's going on here? 
And we walk out of the story before we get to the context. And understanding God is a relationship, which means this, if our, if our, if our following God is, is meant to be a relationship more than a fact that we learn, all relationships grow over time. Every single relationship you have in your life grows over time. When I first met Sarah, my wife, we were playing, uh, uh, there was a group of guys from college, and uh, uh, she was there with a group of her gal friends from college, and we were at La Fortune Park for kind of a party, and we were playing Capture the Flag. I mean, that's about as innocent as all American as it gets, right? We're playing Capture the Flag in La Fortune Park, and I look across the park, and I see this beautiful blonde-haired, blue-eyed, you know, babe. I said it. She's my wife. I can say it. She's over across the park, and I see her, and I think to myself, she's really pretty. I, 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 the, you have that kind of that spark of like, oh, I, I like her, but I didn't think much of it. I didn't know anything about her, didn't have any context for who she was. And then one day, uh, there's a dance that we're going to have at, at, at college, and my roommate had asked Sarah to go to this dance. And she said this, she said, she said, I'll go with you to the dance, but only as friends. There is no future for us. I have no desire to date you. I don't like you like that. We can go as friends, which broke his heart. So he walks back into our dorm room and he's crying and he's kind of upset. And he says, you know, I'm not gonna go with you. If you don't love me like that, then you don't love me at all, baby. And so he put, kind of broke up with her before they were ever even going out. And so he comes back in the room. One of our friends, you ha- I don't know if you have a friend like this, the one that just likes to jab and make everything a little worse because they like stirring stuff up. Well, we had a friend like that and he walks back in the dorm room and he knows that Landon's bummed about this and he says, hey, Ethan, I just ran into Sarah shopping and she bought this beautiful red dress to go to the dance with Landon. It would be a shame for that to go to waste. You should go to the dance with Sarah. And Landon's in the room. He's crying. This makes it worse. And I just thought, yeah, I'd like to make Landon mad. I'll go out. I'll go with Sarah to the dance. So I asked her to go to the dance, and it was totally, that was how it started. Just like, yeah, this sounds fun. I think this would be fun to, because we just, we loved making Landon miserable is the bottom line. And so, <laughs> so we, we went to the dance, and during this whole night, I, I got a chance to talk to Sarah and get to know her. And over the course of the night, I just remember thinking, she's awesome. Man, I love the way that she, that she thinks. I love the way she laughs. I love her sense of humor. I, I love everything about her. And so I dropped her off uh, at her parents' house, walked her up to the front door and, and said goodnight to her and, and walked away. And I got on the phone and called my mom as soon as I was done. And I said, Mom, I just met my wife. And, uh, and her name's Sarah. I started telling her about her. And, and come to find out later, Sarah had a little bit of a different interaction with her mom when she went inside. She, mom said, how'd it go? And she said, eh, It's fine. Come on, like, I, so I had some work to do to let Sarah get to know me and for me to get to know her, and I had to win her over. It was a little bit better than that, I'm sure, but, but the relationship that I had with Sarah at the beginning, what started as just an interaction, grew to be love, but over the next 20 years of being married to her, I've learned more about her at every season of our life. Every time there's a different change of a season, having kids, kids in school, uh, kids in junior high, come on somebody, kids in high school, like these, every season that, this, that our relationship goes through, we, there's, a, there's a new part of who she is that I'm learning. And this is exactly the same way it is with our relationship with God. Our relationship with God grows over time not because God is trying to hold something back from us, not because God is trying to keep something from us, but because God is infinite and there's, this, there's a, an entire journey that we go on where if it's true of Sarah, if it's true for my boys, when, when, when our boys were born and we took them home from the hospital, there was not a thought in my head that said, oh, I know who he is. When Owen was born and he's in his little baby carrier and we bring him home from the hospital and I put him down on the table and he's sitting there. I never once thought, oh, I know who he is. No, what is the thought that you have? This is going to be an incredible journey getting to know him and seeing how God has made him and how God's wired. That's why I love what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3. He says this, and this is the amplified version. I love the way he says it. He says, for my determined purpose is that I may know God, that I may progressively, I love that word, progressively become more deeply and intimately equated with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. 
If our human relationships work this way, how much more our relationship with God? In fact, an infinite God will take an eternity to understand. It'll take an eternity. In fact, I love the way that C.S. Lewis uh, talks about heaven and eternity in his great book called The Great Divorce. He pictures people that follow God in eternity as explorers going further and further into a beautiful mountain, that there's always more to explore. There's always more to learn. And when this becomes our fundamental understanding of God, it produces a trust in us that allows us to stick with God even through tough parts of the story. And I don't, you know, sort of take one encounter with my wife or one encounter with my boys and create my entire relationship based on that one encounter. No, what do I do? I say, because this is a relationship and it's grown over time and it will continue to grow over time, I can work with them through tough times because we are growing together. But this gets tested not in the good times. This gets tested in the trials. This gets tested when something bad happens. This gets tested when there's a tragedy. This gets tested when there's something on the news and we look at it and we just go, how? How, God? How could this happen? If you're, if you're good, why do you allow suffering? Why are there bad things that happen to good people? Why are there innocent people suffering? Why does this happen? But if my relationship with God allows me to try to take a zoomed out approach and go, okay, this is a long story, and right now is not all there is, it allows it to produce in me this attitude. And this is the attitude that I want you to take. And just maybe you just write this down and just, and just think about this and go, where am I on this spectrum of my trust in God? And it's just this. Just because you can't think of a reason why God would do something doesn't mean there isn't one. Just because I can't think of a reason, I go, this happened and I can, I can think of no logical good reason why this would happen. It does not mean there isn't one. And I am not telling you today that God causes tragedy to, just to produce something good. I'm not saying that God brings evil just to produce something better. But what I am saying is that in the overarching history of mankind, twisted and gnarled by sin that grows in our life and in our relationships, God can and will produce something beautiful if we do not give up on our relationship with him if we stick with it. And it produces this attitude that says, okay, my relationship with God is going to grow over time. However, God does not change. In fact, write this down. The character of God never changes. We learn more. We grow. We get more context and more information and more, more ideas of who he is, of the story of God and the long history of mankind and the picture of where God's taking us. But God never changes. This is why these two encounters with Moses matter so much. Because when Moses says, hey, I need to know who you are. In fact, Moses asks God this. He says, God, what is your name? And we saw earlier that God said, I didn't even, I didn't tell my name to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. In fact, everybody up to that point between Abraham and Moses, God was just simply known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In fact, so if you would say, well, which God are you talking about? Oh, that's your dad's God. That's your grandpa's God. That's that God. But God says, I'm going I'm to tell you my name. But when Moses, and this is, this is an important nuance to understand in the Hebrew without kind of geeking out on you too much. Let me just teach for just a second. When Moses looks at God and says, tell me your name, what he's not saying is, what do I call you? What, what's your label? What's the, what's the thing that goes on your office door? No, what Moses is saying is he's saying, what are you like? Who are you? How do I understand you? This is the essence of what Moses is asking God. And it makes sense because Moses is about to embark on a terrifying journey. He's about to go face to face with the ruler of the known world, the most powerful person, trying to liberate a whole group of people. And he's like, God, I can't do this on my own. I'm not enough. I'm inadequate. I need to know who you are. And what is God's response? God tells him his name. And when he tells him his name, he says, here's my name. I am that I am. And as we read that in English, it kind of feels like, Thanks for nothing. That does not clear anything up. I have no more information than I had before. But what God is saying when he says his name, the, the, the best Hebrew understanding of it is to understand God saying this, 
I will be what I will be, which is not to say God, God is not looking at Moses and saying, I'm just going to do whatever I want. That's who I am. I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm Bruce Almighty. I'll, make, I'll, do, I'll just use my power to do whatever I want to do or I fantasize about or is kind of my thing. That's not what God's saying. When God says, I will be who I will be, what he's saying is, I am constant. I do not change. I'm revealing more to you about who I am, but I do not change change. And when God reveals his name to Moses, he's revealing his character. God's name reveals his character. God is saying, I am constant. I am stable. I am steadfast. I am not fickle. All of the gods of Egypt and everybody that you have known has been appeased by sacrifices and fickle and based on the, you know, the, the, the seasons changing or the wind or the rain or the sun or the, the tide of the river water. Like all of those things were what they would interpret God's happiness or his, whether or not he was ple- pleased with them. And God says, I am not fickle. I do not change. I am steady and I'm reliable. And then he goes on to unpack not all of his attributes, meaning uh, God does not tell Moses all of the things he can do. I transcend space and time. I'm all-powerful. I'm all-knowing. I am uh, everywhere at the same time. I'm all-present. God doesn't go through any of the omnis with, with, with Moses. What does he do? He unpacks what we would call character traits, things that you would use to describe a person that you cared about. If I asked you, about your spouse or your best friend, I said, what are they like? You would begin to tell me not just the fact that maybe they might be an incredible basketball player or athlete or they can, you know, do a backflip or they're, you know, they always get straight A's in school. Those are wonderful things about what they can do. But the heart of who somebody is, is what they're like. This is what God tells Moses in Exodus 34. We read these verses earlier. Let's read them again. Verses 6 and 7 says this. It says, Yahweh, Yahweh, this is I am. This is the name of God being revealed for the first time. The compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And that part's awesome. We go, yes, I like that God. But then there's this other half, this other half of the verses. He says, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. And when God reveals this part of his character, it can be tempting to look at this and go, well, then God has two sides. So the answer to the question, is God loving or is God angry? The answer must be both. He must be both of these things because it says he's loving, but he also is, has, has, has judgment. And the understanding of this is important because this is not the only place that this is said. In fact, this, these verses here, when God describes himself, it's the most quoted verses by the Bible in the Bible, meaning that Lots of prophets and New Testament writers would point back at this and they would quote it because this was a pivotal moment in the history of God's people, not just for the Israelites, but for you and me, God describing himself. And when Moses comes down and he's written these things in the Ten Commandments, you can read it in Exodus 20, it said there's an important nuance that's written there that's only implied here, and it says this, it says that I am patient or forgiving or long-suffering to a thousand, and the implied word here is generation. To thousands, it says here, but the real meaning is thousands of generations. That's my love. That's my kindness. That's my long-suffering and my compassion. Yet, he says, there's this, this part of my judgment and my wrath that does affect sin to the third and fourth generation, but it's meant to be a Hebrewism that is like a a, a seesaw. And on one side is thousands of generations of God's compassion, tipping the seesaw so far to God's compassion, not to God's judgment. And as you read through the long story of the Bible, what you see is this. You get to 1 John, and John, the disciple who Jesus loved, that spent all this time with Jesus, he describes God in one word. He says, God is love. God is love. Love. The essence, the fundamental understanding of who God is is that God is love. 
And if God is love and he is unchanging, always constant, he will be who he will be, reliable, always there, not fickle. If he is love and he is unchanging, it means that everything else that he does is not equal to his love, it flows out of his love. Meaning the judgment, the wrath, all of the things that God does that we may look at as anger or getting upset, they are not God changing his personality. They are also not equal parts of God's personality. Everything God does flows out of love. Meaning this, even the wrath of God flows out of the love of God. Because everything that God does comes from this place. And this is the most important understanding you can have. Everything that God does comes out of a place of loving you like a dad would love his kids. Everything. So if there is punishment, if there is discipline for sin, it is because God knows what sin does to you. Not, God is not worried about what sin does to him. If you've ever been you know, taught that Jesus had to come, he had to die to solve the sin problem so that we could be in God's presence, it's true but only partly true if you walk away from that thinking that God shrinks from sin like a vampire from sunlight and he can't, he can't be around sin because it affects him, that's wrong. Sin can't live in God's presence, not because God can't tolerate sin, but because sin dies when it gets in God's presence. God is all powerful, unchanging. Your sin has no effect on God's power. Nothing that we could do could put one dent or one ding or one door scratch in the power or the character of God. He is unchanging. So why does he care about sin? Why is sin a big deal? Why are things that we do to each other and we do to ourselves, why does any of it matter? Because God knows this, it kills you. It kills your soul. Every addiction, every habit, everything you do that's prideful or arrogant or self-centered, it robs you of the beauty that God wants you to experience, the fullness of his life. It takes away his ability to work in you in real and meaningful ways, and it opens the door for the enemy of our soul, Satan, to come in and begin to work in our lives. And God says, I don't want that. So God loves us, and he's long-suffering to a thousand generations. But because he is love, he must make war on sin and Satan out of love for his kids. If my boys are being picked on by someone, maybe hurt, maybe worse, maybe abused by someone, and I walk in and I tell my boys, hey, it's okay, just, let's, just, let's just forget it ever happened. Let's forgive them, it's no big deal. My boys would absolutely have a gut-level, heart-wrenching resentment toward me if I said, there is nothing that I will do about the abuse because I am just kind. I am just happy. I am just passive. I will not make that wrong right. But if you've ever had a situation where something's happening with one of your kids, come on, mama bears, you know what I'm talking about. It's like there's something inside of you that rises up. What is that? That's wrath. That's a holy indignation that this should not be happening to my kids. Does it flow out of anger? No, it flows out of love. And so you step in and you have a desire to make that right. However, if all we see is God stepping in to sin and to make war on our enemies, then we interpret God as angry. If my boys walk into the house and they have a friend over and they come into the house and they track mud in the house, they've been playing outside and they track mud all through the house and, and my wife walks in and she says, boys, get back over here. Nah, clean this up, get this cleaned up, get your shoes over here by the door. If my boy's friend is with them, he's gonna see one side of my wife and he might think, whoa, 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 she is like touchy, she's harsh, this is, this is tough to understand, I don't want to make her upset. But yet my boys, because they have a relationship with her, know mom has said this 475 times. She's told us kindly, she's told us graciously, we know better than this, we forgot, we did something that made a mess, and she's stepping in to make sure that we know this can't happen because it makes a mess, and she wants to make sure that we have a gravity around getting it cleaned up. My, while my boy's friend might see her as angry, my boys know her as loving. Why? Context is everything. 
And when you understand the context of our relationship with God is love, then it begins to make sense out of what we see in the Bible, what we see in our own lives, and honestly, it ought to make sense of every conviction, every bit of pain and hurt that you feel when you sin. The discipline, the conviction, the gut-wrenching grossness that you feel toward what you did that was wrong. God, I don't want to be like that. Why, why is this here? Why does my heart hurt? Why, why can't we just pretend this didn't happen and make it go away? Why do I have to forgive them? Why do I have to have that conversation? Why does the, the, the repairing of this relationship take so long? What is this? It's God not letting you go. It is God loving you as a father and knitting back the holes that sin has ripped in your heart, not just winking at it and going, oh, there, there, don't worry about that. No, he steps in as a father and says, let's make this right. And like a cavity in your tooth, it may be painful to get right, but we're going to fix it. And the pain of God's wrath doesn't hurt you, it heals you. And so when we see God all of his attributes flow out of love. Now, here's where this gets real. Here's where this gets personal, and here's what I hope you leave with today. Because there are things about an infinite God and how an infinite God interacts with us that can be difficult sometimes, the tendency will be when we don't understand everything that God is doing, and come on, everybody that's been in a season of waiting, you know exactly what I'm talking about, a season of of a difficulty in a relationship, something that's happening that you don't understand. Why didn't that job work out? I thought they'd always be here. I thought that person was the one. Why did my friend say that about me? Why am I struggling so much right now in this season? If you've ever been in a season like that, we will interpret God in a difficult way and we'll push away from it. But that is the place where our Commitment to God gets tested, and we have to have faith in his unchanging commitment, his unwavering commitment to us, because it is our commitment to God that allows us to walk through the difficult seasons. You experience this in all kinds of different places in your life. Listen, if you grew up, any any, anybody in here feel like I do about math? You go to math, and it's like, I just don't want to do this. My grandfather was an engineering professor, brilliant man, so when I went to college, I was going to be an engineer. And I said, I'm going to do this for my grandpa. I'm going to be an engineer. And I was relatively good at math in high school. And then I get into calculus in college. And I was like, I cannot do this every day for the rest of my life. And can I just tell you this? You find out how much you really know about math when you try to teach your kids math. You know what I'm talking about? Your third grader comes home and you think you got math wired. And then your third grader comes home and they have math questions. And you're like, I have no idea what's happening right now. Math, much like God, is progressive. And here's what happens. At some point in math, they introduce letters. You know what I'm talking about? It's algebra. It's this. You walk home and your kids have this. This, this is their homework. And you're like, those things don't belong together, first of all. They make no sense. I don't know what to tell you. Ask your teacher. And as you go, if you've ever flipped to the back of a calculus book or a trigonometry book, and you get to the really hard math, it looks a little bit like this. It's just way, way, way worse. It's like, I don't know what's happening right now. I cannot make sense of it. I have no idea what's happening. However, almost everything that you and I interact with in all of our life hinges on somebody being willing to understand that. Somebody being willing to go, I will keep taking lessons. I will keep growing. I will keep learning, and one day I will understand how to solve the almost impossible equations that allow us to sit in seats made of plastic under lights powered by electricity because somebody didn't give up on the progression. Now, here's the challenge. Many of us treat God like difficult math. I don't understand this. I don't get how that works. I don't get how that's possible, and I would not take my math book and throw it out in the first lesson and go, I don't understand the end. Of course you don't understand the end. It's a progression. It's steps. We learn as we grow. God's word and God's relationship with you is exactly the same. There is a progression to it. But if you want the most out of your relationship with God, you have to stay committed when things get tested. Because here's what we want. We want... a. The church word that we use for this is community. It's a sense of you and somebody else clicking. 
me and my wife, me and God, me and my church family, me and my small group, me and my friends. There's a click. I, I trust them. They trust me. We're in this together. We want that community. But can I tell you this? When it comes to God and any other relationship in your life, community comes to the committed. That sense of belonging, that sense of being knit together does not happen with people that live in shallow relationships. If I am committed, it means that I'm going to lean in more. So here's my question for you. This is your homework for this week. How would I rate my commitment to God and my spiritual life right now? What would that be like for you? Uh, no judgment, just grace, just, just, a, just, just an evaluation, just a self-check. How would I rate that? If I really want to see more of God in my life, and I want to see more of him working in me, and I want more of his power at work in all of these places in my life, what is my commitment level? Can I tell you this? This same exact principle works in every area of your life. If you want a better relationship with your kids, don't wish for a better relationship. Check your commitment level. How committed am I to spend time with them, to be with them, to be connected with them, to be praying for them, to be asking them what's going on at a heart level with you right now? How, not just how was your day, not just, not just what was it like. If you want a better relationship with your spouse, check your commitment level. How much time are you investing there? What's it like when things get rocky? Do you tend to doubt them or do you tend to lean in? Do you go, no, I'm with you. We're gonna, we're gonna fight through this. We're gonna lean in together. What's your commitment level? If you want community, it always follows commitment. And this is how committed that God was to you. And this should give you all the faith in, your, in, in the world for you to stay committed to him. Is that there is no God in heaven who's unlike Jesus. What does that mean? Simply means this, that when God wanted to fully reveal himself, he didn't come in a burning bush like Moses. He didn't give 10 commandments on the top of a mountain like he did to Moses. He actually came and put on human flesh and lived with us. And he showed us exactly who God is like. When Jesus shows up, it says this. It says, he went about doing good. That's the, that's the first part of God's character that we read in Exodus. He's loving, he's compassion, he's doing good. But what does it also say? It says, healing all who were oppressed by the devil. What is that? That's him making war on sin and Satan. And in his death and resurrection, he delivered the knockout blow to both of them. However, right now, you and I live between the first knockout of sin and Satan and the ultimate victory when Jesus comes back. And the truth is, one day we'll live in God's presence and we'll understand more fully all of the places where we struggle with this life and his character. But can I just tell you this? There's an awful lot of life between now and then. And when we put our faith in Jesus, what begins to happen is we begin to see this life grow in us that starts to bring victory and new power to every other part of our life. Why? Because that's who God is. Hebrews 1 says that in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through prophets, and, I, and this is Moses, Elijah. He said it happened in many ways and, and lots of different times, but in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. And then it says, through him, the universe was made. In other words, when Jesus showed up, this wasn't the beginning of Jesus' story. This was a continuation of his story. This isn't a new thing. This is, this is God who made the universe coming to be with us. And he is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. In other words, if you want to know what God is like, get close to Jesus. Read about Jesus. Spend time meditating on Jesus. Get with Jesus. Have quiet time with Jesus. Be with Jesus. That's why we talk a lot around here about meeting the real Jesus. Why? It's because, man, when that happens, you know God and your confidence level in him soars. And here's my prayer for us as a church. It's not just that we would have an apologetic answer to a difficult question sort of the, the Ravi Zacharias question when someone comes and tests us, oh, wait, is God loving or is he angry? I hope you do have that answer to that question, but I also hope this, that at a gut level, when life is tough and when you get tested, when you don't wanna be around church, when you don't wanna face your small group, when you don't wanna talk to that person, that you lean into your relationship with God and you say, you know what? I'm going to be more committed than ever before because that's where God becomes more real and my faith grows and I trust that either in this life or the life to come, there will be an answer for everything that I've faced because God is love and he wants to know me. He wants to know you. 
And in this season of life, whether you're new to following God or you've been following God for 50 years, can I just tell you this? God wants to be closer to you, to reveal himself more to you, to give you more wisdom, more victory, and more life in this next season than ever before. But it starts with us. It starts with our heart saying, God, if you're committed to me, I'm committed to you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the chance that we have to talk about something that can be easy to gloss over. It can be tough sometimes to look at what we see in the world, and our world is more divided than ever. We're divided politically, we're divided religiously, we're divided racially, we're divided socioeconomically. God, there's so much that pulls us apart. But we know that when we follow you, there can be community. We can be knit back together, not only with each other, but most importantly with you. And through that, there can be healing. Through that, there can be victory. Through that, there can be a better future in front of us than what lies behind us. So God, our prayer this morning is that you would make yourself known to us. Like Moses prayed, God, would you reveal yourself to us? Would you show us who you are? Show us your glory and your character. We want to know more about you. We want to see you more clearly and follow you more boldly. That's our prayer. And Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that doesn't have a close relationship with you, I ask you to help me to find them and, and bring them home. Help them start that in a real meaningful way today. And with every head bowed, every eye closed, just for, just for a second as a way of responding to God's word, if you're there at your seat and as you're meditating on this, you can feel God working in your heart. And you know that you're not right with God. You know that there's distance between you and you want to make that right. Maybe you've never had a relationship with him and you want to start one. Maybe you'd say, Ethan, no, I grew up in church. I know all the stories, all the songs. I've been around this, but I, I've, I've made some mistakes and I'm far from God and I'd love to restart that and come home today. I'd love to know who you are. I'd love to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I wouldn't do that for anything, but I want to give you a moment before God to say yes to say, yes, I want to know more about you and I want to be closer to you. If that's you, just right there at your seat on either one of those two calls. All you need to do is just slip your hand up and say, Ethan, that's me. That's me. And you can put it right back down. I see that hand. Anybody else? I see that hand. That's awesome. I'm proud of you. Anybody else? You say, yeah, that's me, Ethan. Would you pray for me today? Would you include me? Remember me in your prayer. Anybody else? Anybody else? I don't want to get in a hurry. I see that hand. That's awesome. That's awesome. God loves you and he sees you. And he wants to meet you right where you are. So as we close out our time together, we're going to pray our believer's prayer. We pray this every week as a way to recenter all of our hearts on Jesus because he's central and he's the most important thing. And if you jump in and pray this prayer with us, God will do what only he can do. He'll forgive sins and give you a brand new start. Let's pray this together. Church, let's pray it boldly and loudly. Say this, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus for me. I believe he died and rose again so that I could have new life. Would you meet me where I am and give me a brand new start? In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, I want it all.